Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for your introduction. It's really my great honor to uh, say something about systems analysis in China and some other countries, issue countries. <clears throat> Uh, let me to introduce myself. Uh, I'm a chair professor of system management in China's Academy of Sciences, but I was the president of China Society of System Engineering, uh, as mentioned by uh, Professor Fu, uh, the China System Analysis initiated by Qin Xue Shen, Xu Guozi. Guangzhou Zhi and some uh, very famous scholars in the 50s, last century. <clears throat> uh, because I was the executive director of the Department of Management Sciences of National Science Foundation of China, I visited the Yasa three times in the uh, 1920s and uh, 1990s. <clears throat> Uh, I will uh, introduce the development of uh, system analysis uh, in mainland of China, but I would like to mention something about the uh, system analysis in Hong Kong, Taiwan, and Macau. <clears throat> in Hong Kong, we have uh, seven universities. Uh, most of them have department of system engineering. Uh, this is another term of system analysis. In uh, China, we normally call the system analysis as system engineering. Like a city university, we have a department of system engineering. Uh, in China's University of Hong Kong, we have a department of systems in uh, engineering and engineering management. <clears throat> uh, in, Ch in Hong Kong, we have several uh, academic societies like uh, uh, Software or uh, Society in Hong Kong, uh, the C Society of System and Engineering of Hong Kong. Uh, the same situation in Taiwan. Uh, in Taiwan, we have uh, more than 10 uh, universities who have a uh, department of uh, system engineering, like uh, National Jiao Tong University has department of transportation system engineering. Uh, in uh, National Tsinghua University, we have a department of uh, industrial engineering and uh, uh, informatics. <coughs> uh, in Taiwan, we also have several very active uh, societies related to system analysis, the same situation in uh, Macau. <clears throat> in, in China, mainland of China, uh, more than 100 universities have system analysis, system engineering departments. Uh, <clears throat> actually, in China, we have five academic societies like system engineering, China system engineering uh, of society, uh, China uh, society of system thinking and like that. Uh, <clears throat> each year in mainland of China, uh, those uh, academic societies uh, organize more than 1,100 uh, conferences and workshops of uh, system analysis in China each year. <clears throat> uh, very recently, uh, many big uh, enterprises establish centers, research units of system engineering, system analysis uh, in China, mainland of China, like Huawei, Jindong, uh, it will, uh, I have to mention that uh, in China, the uh, Chinese government, uh, including uh, local government, uh, strongly support uh, 
the research, especially the applications of system analysis, system engineering. <clears throat> and like uh, uh, our presidents, peoples of Republic of China, uh, uh, Jiang Zemin, Hu Jintao, Xi Jinping, always encourage scholars, enterprises, government departments to do research and to resolve issues, problems with system engineering, system analysis. <clears throat> Uh, <clears throat> Professor Xi, uh, uh, the vice president of the National Science Foundation of China, <clears throat> knows uh, more than four departments of nine departments in National Science Foundation uh, grant <clears throat> uh, research projects <clears throat> in the field of uh, system related to system analysis, uh, especially for uh, every major research project. <clears throat> Ministry of Science and Technology, Ministry of uh, Education, Ministry of Commerce, uh, Ministry of uh, Environment, uh, even the State of Commission, State Commission of uh, development and reforms of People's Republic of China uh, support many uh, system analysis related research uh, projects. <clears throat> uh, it, it should be mentioned that nowadays in mainland of China, our government made a new policy, uh, including economic policy, industry uh, policy, uh, should uh, to adopt a system analysis to design and assess. <clears throat> uh, not like my team, uh, neither by myself, uh, we had uh, involved uh, research projects uh, related to uh, system analysis, like economic and social development economy, environment, energy, population, uh, society system, uh, economy reform, financial innovation, stability, uh, industrial updating, uh, reform of <coughs> uh, new uh, enterprises, uh, regional development. Uh, even for the university reforms, we use uh, we adopt uh, system analysis methodology to study them. Korea <clears throat> uh, uh, is very uh, active and popular uh, uh, in the field of uh, system analysis. I would like to mention that Korea, uh, Japan, uh, Korea, Singapore, uh, because I was uh, a professor at the uh, Singapore Nations University. Uh, I would like to mention that uh, system analysis is very hot in Singapore. Uh, all three universities have units of system analysis. Uh, <clears throat> some academic uh, societies strongly relate to uh, system analysis in Singapore are very active. Uh, each year, uh, those academic uh, conferences, uh, academic uh, societies organize uh, many uh, conferences and workshops on uh, system analysis. Uh, <clears throat> I, I would like to show you uh, some examples I have done uh, in the field of system analysis or system engineering. <clears throat> the first example is that uh, <clears throat> um, my team developed uh, uh, the global economic monitoring, earning warning, forecasting, and policy simulation system for that. Chinese government. This is a world platform for the uh, <coughs> State Council uh, 
the Office of State Council of People's Republic of China uh, for cross ministries in economic monetary only warning and policy coordination. Uh, <clears throat> we adopted uh, many uh, information technology uh, operations research modeling and uh, uh, techniques of information systems uh, to uh, design the system. Uh, uh, I, I would like to say that uh, this system uh, works very well. Uh, <clears throat> some subsystem have been uh, allocated in the Central Bank of China, the State Commission of Development of Reforms, Ministry of Commerce, Ministry of Finance, State Bureau of Foreign Exchange. Uh, those uh, subsystems efficiently support the, those governments, dep government departments in their uh, policy making. <clears throat> Sorry. The second uh, example, I would like to mention that a uh, case. <clears throat> in, 90, uh, in 2008, uh, the uh, American financial crisis uh, influenced China uh, very much. So uh, our <clears throat> Chinese economy uh, was uh, Inflowed, uh, the situation uh, was terrible. Uh, so the state council uh, requested us to, uh, to, to, to make some proposal. Uh, my team uh, used integer programming together with system dynamics modeling and uh, similar uh, input output analysis and some other uh, quantitative. Uh, methods uh, to uh, design uh, a, 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 a solution proposal for the uh, Chinese government. Uh, our uh, proposal uh, was adopted by the <coughs> Chinese government. And that's why uh, we published, uh, invited the article uh, as a feature article in the uh, ORMS today. Uh, this is a flag magazine of the informs in the United States. <clears throat> uh, very recently, uh, I published four papers. Uh, uh, one uh, is about the water resource management in the lost uh, China. Uh, the second one uh, is uh, green development and uh, Bitcoin. Uh, <clears throat> uh, this uh, paper uh, was deeply reported by CNN, BBC, uh, even uh, Time Magazine, uh, Economist, Wash. Uh, 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 Wall Street Journal and uh, the Financial Times, uh, even for the New York Times, Washington Post. The uh, second uh, third paper uh, was uh, related to the assess assessing China's effort to pursue uh, 1.5 degrees centigrade. Uh, Warning limit. Uh, this paper uh, was published by Science in May. <clears throat> uh, the fourth paper uh, is related to the Chinese uh, iron making and steel making emissions. Uh, we use uh, system analysis methods like uh, system dynamics. Uh, input output analysis uh, 
um, optimization, uh, you, even for the mixed uh, integer programming, uh, <coughs> uh, dynamic programming, uh, 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 CG models uh, to study. Uh, this is very important and uh, uh, urgent uh, issues uh, uh, raised for the Chinese development. <clears throat> Uh, for the future development of uh, system analysis in Asia, uh, uh, I would like to say uh, we have great demands, uh, even for China, India, uh, Japan, Korea, uh, Iran, uh, the demand is uh, huge. <clears throat> uh, we, we have good uh, conditions, uh, like in Japan, Korea, China, India, uh, Singapore, uh, we have uh, very uh, good uh, universities, uh, uh, <clears throat> Department of System Analysis, Department of System Engineering, uh, working on uh, <clears throat> uh, greater issues uh, for development in Asia. Uh, we have good people, uh, like in China, China Society of System Engineering. Uh, this society is one of the five academic societies of uh, system analysis in mainland of China. Uh, this society, the China Society of System Engineering, we have 20,000 members, personal members, uh, uh, about uh, 3,000 enterprises members. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, I would like to say that uh, we uh, have much space for our development, for our improvement of uh, system analysis in future. <clears throat> uh, of course, uh, more cooperation with other parts of the world under the help, with the help and under the supervision of YASA uh, is needed. <clears throat> uh, that's uh, what I would like to mention. Thank you. Thank you, Ian, and uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, again, warm welcome to everybody, and uh, we look forward to this engagement uh, across the Asian region. Um, I'm going to try and give you a little bit of a taste of what's happening at IASA at the moment and some of the interesting work that's going on, and hopefully it will be a sort of stimulate the conversation and open up some questions that we can uh, try and address as, as uh, at the Institute. Um, just to start off the conversation, I always give you a, a harsh assessment of where we find ourselves as humanity uh, at the beginning of the talk. Uh, where do we stand? Um, we have vast inequalities in the world. From a wealth perspective, we have 71% of adults own less than $10,000 in wealth across the world. From a health perspective, uh, there's been some positive developments. Life expectancy has doubled uh, in a century, um, but we also know that inequalities have increased. One million people are obese, while a smaller number, about 800 million, go hungry across the world. Um, acute hunger affects 100 million people in 2018. And of course, COVID-19 has just simply taken these problems and made them worse uh, for many societies and for many communities. From an environmental perspective, nine out of 10 people breathe air with high level of pollutants. One in nine people use water from an unsafe source and 2.3 billion people lack access to a toilet. From a happiness perspective, more die by suicide than war and violence on an annual basis. Happiness inequality is on the rise. Alternatively, everybody in the world has a mobile phone, but a billion people have no access to electricity, so they can't use them. 
3 billion people suffer from land degradation, desertification, and have missed out on the great acceleration over the past decades. So this is where we stand. These summarizes the challenges that we face, uh, some of the um, societal inequities that we have to tackle and deal with. Now, from a policy development point of view, we all understand that the policy making is always a very complicated uh, process. We at IASA understand how complicated that is uh, because there are always many feedback loops and all the other activities and trade-offs that you have to make in a policy making uh, environment. You're always faced with complex problems, complex issues. Uh, it's never a straightforward uh, linear solution to any particular problem that has to be dealt with. And because of this, because of the complexity in the, in the policy making landscape, we feel that systems analysis adds significant value to the strength of the policy making and the robustness of that policy making as it develops. There are a couple of characteristics of systems thinking that are important to keep in mind. The first is that frequently when we analyze a problem, we draw boundaries around that problem. And as a consequence, we sometimes exclude variables that impact on those boundaries, artificial boundaries that we've drawn. As a consequence, we create externalities, whether that's in an economic context or an environmental solving problem context or in a social sol sol uh, context. This means that we need to adopt more holistic views of the systems we're trying to analyze and trying to interpret. And we need to adopt a more holistic view in terms of coming to solutions so that we minimize the externalities that can impact on our analysis into the future. We must also understand that in a complex system like that, there are gonna be multiple feedback loops. Uh, these impact the system as a whole. If we ignore those or overlook them in our analysis, uh, the policies and the outcomes that we, uh, that we achieve are going to be poorer as a consequence of that. We also have trade-offs and synergies that happen uh, across um, these complex systems. It's really important uh, if these trade-offs and synergies are left outside the system boundaries that we're investigating, um, or those relationships, trade-offs and synergies are poorly quantified. Uh, this can result in major errors in our predictions and our forecasts about the kinds of end results we're trying to achieve. In complex uh, systems, we also have emergent phenomena, surprises, new events that occur that nobody would have anticipated. Uh, this that flummoxes the best planning at the end of the day. Uh, and it's really important, particularly in societies and where norms and uh, beliefs and other uh, real world forces uh, affect societies that we ensure that we keep the human and social dimensions of system think thinking on board at the same time. Let's not forget that we're working with people and trying to solve people problems at the end of the day. When a policy challenge involves many stakeholders, there are many people that are affected by it. It is important that they are part of the process of finding the solution. Otherwise, whatever policy you come up with is unlikely to be adopted and unlikely to be implemented and unlikely to find traction in the community where you're trying to solve that particular problem. So these are just some of the characteristics of systems thinking that we have to th uh, take forward and uh, see if we can internalize in our analysis. Just to give you a sense of the holistic uh, accounting of impacts, what it means, this is a work from the Global Energy Assessment that just demonstrates that if we were trying to solve problems around energy security itself, it cost us just below 0.2% of the global GDP, which is on the left-hand side here. If you were trying to solve problems of air pollution around the world, that could cost us about 0.5% of the global GDP on the left-hand side. And if we were focusing only on climate change as a problem, maybe just over 0.8% of the global GDP would be required to deal with that problem. But we know that these things are related and linked to each other. And if we pursue an integrated solution that looks at energy, air pollution, and climate at the same time, we can actually save about 40% of the cost of solving the problem 
by having an integrated solution rather than dealing it on a, in a silo manner uh, across these various individual problems. The power of positive feedback loops. This just demonstrates uh, for the Indian population um, the consequences of what we call in our projections uh, stall development. In other words, where there's no major investment in education uh, across the subcontinent as, an, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a scenario. Um, this is what the population is, structure is likely to look like in 2060. Which there's a major investment in education on the left-hand side, the sustainable development scenario, you can see that the education profile of the entire population has fundamentally changed. And this is really important uh, for us to understand that these kinds of policy interventions, like focusing on primary and secondary, secondary education, as in this particular example, can make a fundamental difference to the long-term trajectory of the population. And of course, then the, the shape and the power of your workforce that you engage with uh, in that country at the end of the day, it makes a significant difference to your tax base and all sorts of other activities. Just to indicate some synergies, sometimes uh, there are things that we do that uh, results in gains that were maybe not planned. Uh, this is, shows the shift towards digitalization and the idea of device convergence over time. What you have in this list here is a list of a large number of items which you would have had in your home over the last 20 years or so uh, in various forms. And it indicates the energy requirement for every one of those individual devices, with both in terms of a consumption uh, mode and the standby mode. The end result of all these uh, items that you have in your household is that you as an individual would probably have required some 450 watts of power consumption and 72 watts on the standby mode to deal with this. Of course, these devices have all now been replaced by a single device today, the smartphone. We don't need that anymore. The smartphone requires only five watts to operate. So by moving towards a digital age, we've actually saved considerable amounts of energy on the demand side uh, for particular societies. And so this is a synergistic benefit of moving uh, into the digital age that we should be aware of as well. There are trade-offs. Uh, this just illustrates some work that was done some time ago, but indicates that we can be very ambitious as far as dealing with environmental and uh, conservation issues and planetary boundary issues are concerned. We can be very aggressive in that space, but there's a consequence. And the trade-off is that we do know that when we are aggressive on the planet, uh, planetary boundaries issues, this will lead to higher food prices probably into the future. And we need to understand that. They, nothing we do is without consequences and trade-offs are really important in terms of understanding the systemic consequences of policy decisions that we take. Emergence, uh, who would have predicted two years ago today that we would be having this hybrid conference as a consequence of COVID? Um, IASA has been doing quite a bit of work on the aftermath of COVID and the consequences for societies and how we can bounce back uh, better, uh, bouncing forward, as we call it, uh, into a more sustainable world and a more sustainable pathway uh, out of the COVID pandemic. Uh, this is really important for societies to use these kinds of crises to emerge stronger at the other end of the game. But again, an unplanned, uh, unpredicted event that has affected the entire globe uh, and we must understand that in systems analysis and in systems there will be surprises that we have to tackle and deal with. We also have to work very hard in places where we have a lot of stakeholders involved. This is the processes, the bottom-up processes being driven by the SDSN network together with the ASA and the FABLE project to, to record the progress that's being made in the SDS, uh, SDG landscape, sorry, sustainable development goals. This process is bottom up. It follows a very close co-design, co-production and co-implementation framework, broad participation, and it makes sure that societies are involved in the measurement, the monitoring, the reporting and the reflection of their own progress as far as sustainable development goals are concerned. The SDSN network is working very hard to make sure 
that the citizens and the uh, citizens, citizenry around the world uh, applies the right kind of pressures on government to respond more effectively to the challenges of the Sustainable Development Goals. If you involved with the ASA and you come and visit us here at the Institute, um, these are the tools of the trade that you will encounter in our corridors uh, as you move around and so talk to people. And these are common to most systems analysis uh, platforms around the world. And we use them ourselves uh, on an ongoing basis. Uh, but the idea is to bring all of those uh, that expertise together in the space of systems analysis science. We also work at a global scale as an institution. Um, sometimes in our analysis, they emerge multiple benefits, synergies again, uh, in that sense. Um, this is a recent bit of work that demonstrates uh, through the Nature Map Consortium, led by IASA, that it is possible for us around the world that if we strategically place 30% of land for conservation, that we could also, as a consequence, safeguard 70% of all terrestrial plant and vertebrate animal species, while also conserving more than 62% of the world's above and below ground vulnerable carbon and 68% 68% of the clean water. So there are huge benefits for analyzing the system collectively and understanding exactly what the potential benefits are of interventions such as the 30% conservation uh, objective. As we all know food production is a major problem around the world, and we also know that nitrogen is a vital, vital component uh, that allows us to produce food effectively, but we also understand that too much nitrogen can be really harmful to the ecosystem in which we function. Uh, and so this study is just really important to demonstrate to us that there are optimal levels of nitrogen that can be applied to maximize uh, uh, agricultural production but does not become toxic to the broader environment. And so I think the idea of uh, finding optimal solutions and by closely understanding the trade-offs that are involved, we can come with, up with better policy interventions. This is just coming back to the equity theme that we spoke about earlier. Um, this is a recent paper from Science, which clearly demonstrates issues around intergenerational inequity. In other words, the decisions that we take today are going to affect future generations significantly. Um, newborns now born today, your children and my children, uh, will on average face seven times more heat waves during their lives than their grandparents. On average, uh, they will live through 2.6 times more droughts 2.8 times as many river floods, almost three times as many crop failures, and twice the number of wildfires as people born 60 years ago. We're not leaving a very good legacy for the future and for the next generation. And that's why critical intervention is required on our side to make sure that we take the right decisions today. This just demonstrates that. This analysis just demonstrates quite clearly that in the broader Asian region, if we use our message and glow biome modeling capabilities at YASA, uh, that a radical change in the energy portfolio is required across the Asian continent uh, to achieve targets of well below two degrees Celsius increase. Um, this is really important and that it really means that that entire sector requires a radical transformation and not just a, a gradual transformation because we will not achieve the objectives if we don't actually transform these sectors quite dramatically across the Asian region. Much of our work is, being, is starting to be, uh, make an impact at the policy level. Uh, this is particular work in the Indus Valley, uh, really interesting work that looks at the issues of water use, energy, uh, and, and the land use all together at the same time. The work was a bottom-up process, a co-production exercise that resulted in participation from seven countries that have an interest in and around the Indus Valley as a whole. But what this figure just demonstrates at the bottom end is that business as usual clearly is not a scenario that anybody wants to pursue because that simply results in unsustainable futures across the water, energy, and land use sectors as a whole. 
What we do have here are three potential pathways that emerge from the analysis and the workshop uh, activities that demonstrate that there is possibility for a resilient future as far as water security, energy security, and land use is concerned. That's the top uh, option. But that there are also alternative pathways that approximate or get very close to a very resilient future, depending on the values and the priorities of different stakeholders involved in the negotiation process. So there's a suite of pathways that can be developed and actually be uh, put on the table. And depending on the uh, the values and the priorities of different societies, we can get much closer to a resilient future than just simply pursuing business as usual, simply because it's more convenient and uh, we don't want to go to the trouble of planning our futures effectively. So this just demonstrates what systems analysis can do for you when you work together in this regard. It's also really important, this is a, a uh, quality work that EASA is doing in Vietnam. Um, we're working with VAST, uh, and we've done some work across different five different regions of Vietnam, focusing around the region of Hanoi, uh, but also the surrounding countryside. I think what we're trying to do here, first of all, is it's a multidisciplinary research community in Vietnam that's uh, participating in this exercise to understand the air quality issues uh, in the broader Vietnam but also to at the same time to develop capacity and grow capacity within VAST so that they can actually do their own modeling and assessment into the future uh, to make to understand how they're going to deal with uh, air quality issues uh, in Vietnam into the future. This is the kind of work that IASA likes to get involved with. Also, from the financial sector, it's important that IASA has done some um, quite a bit of work in the financial sector uh, more recently. Um, we understand the systemic risks that uh, emerge from financial interconnections. Uh, we saw that in 2008 and 2009, as Professor Wang just illustrated a little bit earlier uh, in, his, in his talk as well. Uh, some of the ASA work has demonstrated that we can reduce the vulnerability and the risks associated with the systemic financial networks by introducing a systemic risk tax. Uh, onto the financial systems at the end of the day. So there's just one uh, small little intervention that makes a difference to uh, that particular space. I thought I would just show you this video. Sorry. Also, when you come to IASA, uh, we focus on uh, techniques and uh, we develop a lot of models at IASA that we use. Uh, our strength is not only that we have these different models, such as the energy planning module or the uh, air quality modules, uh, land use models and um, water, community water models, but that we can actually get these models to start talking to each other increasingly over time. And so we're getting better and better at integrating these models and also align them with population economic forecasts to really make uh, predictions that make sense in the context of uh, that part of the world. Just an interesting uh, recent result that comes from China, which is really important. Uh, the traditional view is always that an aging population uh, will precipitate a tax burden uh, on future generations. Uh, in this regard, I think what's important about this particular analysis is it demonstrates that when, even when you have a, de a declining population, if you couple that with an increase or a growth in human capital, in other words, investing heavily in the quality of the population that you are developing, 
uh, that the threat of a declining population can actually be overcome. The idea is here yeah, that it is not necessarily the quantity of your workforce uh, that determines your economic future, but the quality of that workforce that defines the future uh, economic tra trajectory of a region. We also spend quite a bit of time doing scenario work. Uh, we will be focusing on COP uh, in Glasgow over the next month or so. Uh, and one of the interesting pieces of work that we've done is to develop together with a number of our research partners uh, a tool that allows people to assess different climate scenarios for long-term strategic planning across countries and to support coordinated global climate action at the end of the day. This tool is available and provides a, a nice planning tool for countries to assess their options into the future. We have been using artificial intelligence more recently, uh, in this particular instance, to use artificial intelligence to help us monitor and measure deforestation in the Amazon uh, as a particular project. Uh, the idea for us is to use the power of AI to scan, train an AI to scan uh, satellite images, as you see in front of you here, and to detect human uh, interference in the forest uh, through different kinds of interventions. So the idea is here that to, at some stage, once the AI is properly trained, is to unleash it on the images that are available and become regularly available across the Amazon forest and to move us towards uh, lots of technicians sitting in a lab trying to interpret um, these images to an AI doing it for us and to get us to the point where we can deliver near real-time assessments of global environmental change uh, in the Amazon forest. So we at IASA have been focusing on a new strategy. Uh, there are seven, seven interlinked research themes, the four domains in the middle of the figure, and the three broad pressures that exert themselves on those domains. And this has been translated into six new programs with a new foci of activity at IASA, focusing on just societies, uh, new economic frontiers, biodiversity, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. Uh, we are also launching a number of large-scale interdisciplinary research projects together with our national member organizations uh, and focusing on capacity development across the entire region and the instruments that we put in, put in place. At the same time, IASA will continue to grow its um, ongoing activities as a science diplomacy platform uh, for, the, for the entire global community. So thank you very much for listening to me and I look forward to the conversation. Thank you.